The concept for ePAR trade is basically, in my opinion, there's a big hole in the internet. So the internet started many years ago, but there's never been an online business community for racers on the World Wide Web. The need for ePAR trade is actually quite obvious. Basically, people in the business of auto racing need a place online to hang out and get their problems solved. It's extremely simple for a buyer or for a supplier to interact on the platform. The first thing you need to do is sign in, which is free. And the second thing is when you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on request more information. If it's a company, you click on request more information. And then from there, it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. You can go to epartrade.com, you become part of a community of businesses in racing and it makes uh, sourcing products much easier than just on the internet or using Google. At epartrade there is no e-commerce, it's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier through an email. More than that, it's a place to go just to keep current every day. So it's a good place to start your work day in your racing business or in your offices of your professional race team. And you know you're current when it comes to new technology, industry news, technical papers, technical videos, all of that and more. We're not looking for a million hits per day. All we want is people who are really the volume buyers of racing products in the racing industry to be part of the little world of ePart trade. We have racing businesses participating from around the world. So you get suppliers from around the world, you get buyers from around the world. ePAR Trade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. Well, we do have a very special race industry now this week, and we are joined by Ken Clapp, a former executive with NASCAR and a West Coast racing promoter and so many more. We're going to learn a lot about him with his new book and the executive vice president with Penske Corp, Walt Zarnicki, uh, who obviously is still very active in racing here today with what Team Penske is doing and a lot of other great things around uh, motorsports as well. Uh, Ken, I want to start with you. We're here to talk about a new book that is coming out, and the title of the book, See the Shining Sea from the west coast or from the wild west to daytona beach so um first let's just talk about the book the title and uh and what you have coming out here soon well the book was um, let's call it a, a pressure initiative for a number of years a lot of my friends would say why don't you put down on paper all of the history of the west because there's not very many people left anymore that can tell the story and Ralph Shaheen especially was really pushed me hard. Uh, Herschel McGriff, who's been a friend for 70 years now, was another one constantly on me about it, but many others too. So I started thinking about it and I was down at the Chili Bowl about four or five years ago and I was talking to a fellow named Lou Boyd who owns Coastal 181 back in Massachusetts. And uh, they, they are uh, suppliers of all kinds of motorsports books. And I said, Lou, how much involvement is there in writing a book? And he said, a lot, <laughs> it's a big project. So one thing came to another and in the very beginning, it started out that he was going to actually do the book himself. However, uh, he had a, a bit of a health issue uh, about three, three years ago. And, uh, so we realized that probably wasn't a realistic way to go. And I talked to Bones Borchier in Indianapolis. Bones has done about 15 or 18 books. More recently, the Parnelli Jones book and the uh, Bentley Warren book. And it goes on and on. And Bones and I instantly became friends. Uh, we've been working on it now three years and it's done. It's going through final proofing, uh, putting pictures with stories. It's, it's going to probably be printed in about three to four more months. Now, that's how it came about to restore the history of the West. It was never intended that it be about Ken Clapp, but it's pretty hard to tell the story when you've played the story. So uh, there we are. And 
for better or worse. I, I hope the world enjoys it, those, those that read it. So we'll see. Well, as a big fan of the history of the sport, and I know Walt Zarnicki is the same, I really look forward to getting my hands on it and reading it as well. And Walt, both you and Humpy Wheeler have written forwards for the book as well. So I'll just turn it over to you for just a quick second and maybe let you talk about some of the things that really come to mind when you think of racing in the West and Ken, and maybe even if there's a little anecdote or something that um, that we can talk about with the forward. Sure, Brad. I, I think that, uh, first of all, I, I heard about this concept about three years ago. I was on the West Coast, unfortunately, for the funeral of a friend. And Ken was happened to be at that same funeral. And uh, we were riding in the car, I think, from the service to the luncheon. That's where I first heard about it. When you brought it up in a conversation, he said, I'm writing this book. Or I got to get back to work on this book. What book is this, Ken? He said, well, sort of the history of stock car racing on the West Coast. And I came to the same conclusion Brad, that uh, Ken did, not having part of it, not, not, not having lived it like he has, certainly. But if someone doesn't write this history, this very important part of, a, of the American motorsports scene, it wasn't going to get written. Because people, we're, we're now in the third generation, or maybe the fourth generation, Ken, I don't know if the racers on the West Coast. But this really depicts, so anyway, long story short, Ken and I talked about it. He kept me up to speed. And here about, um, it was actually before Christmas time, uh, Bones started sending me the first drafts of the book for me to read. So I was reading almost a chapter a week or a couple chapters a week. And Ken asked me to go through it. And if I saw anything in there that, you know, I thought my, I may, I may uh, have a different perspective on it, or if I caught any typos or any errors. So that's what I did. I proofread the book. Well, I couldn't put the thing down. Being a racer, if you're a racer and you're, and you're a fan, I mean, this is part of motorsports in America that you know, folks in my part of the world don't even know about. But it's so important to how the sport grew in post-war America. So anyway, so I was honored when Ken asked me here a couple of months ago to, to write the forward. Well, it all kind of came to a head about 10 days ago when Bones called me and he said, well, have you written that forward yet? I said, well, when's it due? He said, I need it next week. So, so it's done. Uh, I think Ken's read it. Bones has read it. But being a student of the sport, having been involved in professional motor racing for, I hate to admit it, you know, 55 plus years or more, I've seen a lot. Uh, and I was always intrigued with the, with the West Coast piece of it. We can talk about this perhaps a little bit later on. But my first real introduction was back in the, in the, in the late 60s. I was the manager of American Motors racing programs. And we were involved in, in NASCAR, what they call the Grand American Series. We were in drag racing. So that took me to the West Coast a lot. And of course, the Trans Am. And it was racing in the Trans Am, racing at places like, like Sears Point and Riverside and Kent, Washington and other places. And, and I got to know and meet Les, or meet and know Les Richter, worked together with him later on. So that was really my first, my first point of contact. So that's really my background on it. Then I got to know Ken here a little bit later on. We oh, that's great. And, and this is wonderful. And this is going to be fun to kind of swap stories and share stories, especially talking about Sears Point, uh, which Ken was a big part of as well. You know, Ken, Walt was just saying, you know, 55 plus years in NASCAR uh, or in motorsports, I should say. And, right. and Ken, if you go back and, and look you up on the Internet, um, it says that you retired about 20 years ago, but I don't think you've actually ever retired. You're in your 71st year of racing now. In fact, you started this by lying about your age, didn't you? That's correct. Uh, this is my 71st season. Uh, I hung around a garage in Walnut Creek, California, and they had race cars. And I kind of got my dad interested. And we started going to the races. And uh, actually, September 7th, 1951, at a track in Stockton, California, that years later, I ended up owning. And that was it. I was hooked. And the next two consecutive weeks, we went again, uh, October 14th, NASCAR came to the famed old Oakland Speedway, Oakland, California. And the next week I talked my mom and dad into going to a AAA sanctioned Indianapolis car race on the mile at San Jose, which again, I also ended up operating for about 40 years. But uh, in fact, there's a trophy behind me here. Uh, of the Tony Bettenhausen won the race 
the Indianapolis car race that day and the Merle Bellinger 99 that Mee Waller did one Indianapolis with that year. And Tony Benton House and I had the privilege of getting to know later. And uh, I ended up with that trophy about six months ago. It was in Indianapolis uh, in Dick Jordan's museum at his home. And uh, I spotted it years ago and I told Dick the story. And that day he put my name on the bottom of it. And when we lost Dick uh, a while back. Uh, it was transported on out here by some friends that had driven to Indy. And here it is. And uh, people say, well, what, what's it mean? And, well, it means a lot to me. Later in life, I knew Gary, I knew Merle, uh, Sue Bentonhausen, uh, kind of the forgotten Bentonhausen, but she and I are very good personal friends. And uh, so that trophy means, means a great deal to me. When I'm gone, it's going to go to a museum. And that's all arranged already, too. So I didn't mean to get, get off there, but um, I, I do want to mention one thing. Walt and I met on a patio in Japan uh, for an Indianapolis car race many, many, many years ago. It was a NASCAR race, Ken. Was it NASCAR? NASCAR, sure. I thought it was an IndyCar race. Oh, I was there with, with, with Rusty Wallace. Okay. Wow. Well, I don't think... Uh, things happen and i was sitting there and he came walking by we'd met actually we'd had dinner one night together in new york city his wife and mine and so on but anyway uh i consider walt a dear very close friend and uh, we have a lot of fun talking and uh analyzing and um trying to resurrect uh, everything in our opinion with our views and Sometimes maybe we're a few years behind times, but anyway, the sport's healthy and growing and I'm happy. It, it is well, healthy. I think well, things, Brad, that, that we did, did have in common, although I've been around for 55 years, but background's somewhat similar in the sense that I grew up in Detroit. My father was a huge fan, huge race fan. Went to his first Indianapolis 500 in 1934. And I went to my first IndyCar, went to the first Indy 500 in 1960. But as a little boy, he, my dad had a friend who had a midget. I think I've told Ken this story. He had a midget that used to run at a place called Motor City Speedway, which was a quarter mile track on the east side of Detroit. And they ran twice a week, usually Mondays and Saturdays. And we were regulars. And then we lived, then we lived about two miles from the Michigan State Fairgrounds where there was a one mile dirt track. And NASCAR used to have a big event there every single year. In fact. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the champ car side, the old AAA days, uh, that was the first race on the schedule after the Indianapolis 500. So we'd make the walk, we'd walk a couple of miles to the fairgrounds, go to the race, come home covered in dirt, but had a great time. So th those are my roots in the business. And that's where I, like Ken, that's where I fell in love with the sport, never thinking in my wildest dreams that I'd be involved in the sport professionally at some point in my life. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting, Ken, um, and I really do look forward to reading the book for sure. Um, you talk about your long history in here. 1955, you're actually part of a championship winning team. And this is even before, you know, really getting into sort of like the meat of your career and the administrative side and, and, and promoting races and all of that. But when you look at everything that you have done, you know, sometimes we look at motor racing as there's the team side, the drivers, the crew members, the mechanics, there's the promoter side, the racetracks and all of that, the sponsor side. And, and, and a lot of people have a tendency to kind of stick with what they know. Uh, but you and Walt, both of you have sort of seen every side of this, whether it be the race team, the race promotion, whatever it might be. What all have you done, Ken? I mean, when you start to look at all of the things in your career. Well, let's just take a real brief second here. Uh, I was with the winning team in 1955. In those days, NASCAR's top level, which today we would all call Cup, uh, had sort of an equal participation on the West Coast. Uh, we could actually beat Lee Petty and Junior Johnson and some of those guys, and then they'd come out here and they could they could beat our guys as well, but uh, it was more of a level playing field. And in 1954, I became acquainted with a fellow 
from Concord, California, by the name of Cos Kinsella. He had Oldsmobiles, good Oldsmobiles, and they won a lot of races from 1950 with the Olds 88 forward. And so uh, he was a World War II vet, and married, had a son, and uh, I was young enough to be his son. But for some reason, he took a shine to me, and I said, I'd sure like to be able to go to the races with you. And I was, I was work, I was at the shop working on the car or getting in the way. I'm not sure which, but anyway, he, he said, well, you're not old enough. I said, well, what if I had a license? He said, you get a license and I'll take you with me. So I went to a stationery store in the town that we lived in Lafayette, California, which was just a few miles away. And I bought two uh, blank ID cards and I bought two because I knew I'd probably mess the first one up. I speculated out my age and I made myself even older than I needed to be to be able to get a NASCAR mechanics license. So I used my dad's uh, old spice talcum powder in my hair to try to gray my hair. I didn't shave, but about once a week then anyway. So I'd go for weeks and not shave. I filled the first card in. I did make a mistake. Uh, the second one, I got it right. Uh, I believe I put a $10 bill in the envelope and sent a laminated copy of that ID card to Daytona Beach. I thought I'd probably never see my $10 again and uh, I'd have to wait till I was 21. I didn't have a California driver's license yet. I was only 15 years old, but I was almost six foot tall and skinny as a rail. So anyway, three weeks later, I came home from school one afternoon and picked up the mail out of the mailbox and there was my license. And so we did win the NASCAR Western, uh, we'll call it Grand National in those days, championship uh, with, a, with an Oldsmobile. Danny Lentner was the driver. Uh, and that was the beginning. That's how it happened. Wow. That's really incredible. Um, and then as your career moves on, um, you actually start to move over to the admin side of the business. And this is really about 10 years later or so. How yes. does it come to be that, you know, you want to be a mechanic, you're doing all of that, and now you're working on the business side? Well, several things happened. Uh, I suppose I was a little bit critical of some of the promotions, the way they were being done, but I certainly wasn't qualified to be a critic. Uh, I'd never done it. Uh, I had a job that involved marketing, management of people, money control, and so on. So I had a very interesting daytime job, married to little girls. I, I got the idea one day, kind of out of the wild blue sky, that I, I'm going to promote a car race. And a buddy of mine that I'd known since we were six years old, joined forces with me and we rented a racetrack in Vallejo, California and a dirt track. And we did a race. And in fact, there's an interesting sidebar to it. Uh, the motorsports editor of the San Francisco Chronicle was close friends with a fellow named Bev Spencer, who was the Buick distributor out part, part of the West coast after Charles Howard that owned Seabiscuit steps away. And uh, we were at a dinner one, one evening, a sports a sportsman dinner. And uh, he said, you ought to get George Fulmer to run your race. I said, George Fulmer? He said, yeah. I, I said, he's a sports car driver. He, he said, yeah, but he's a friend of mine. And if you advertise him properly, you're going to get sports car fans along with Oval Track fans. So George and I, it's, it's funny, I look back on it now, George and I made a deal. He came all the way up from Santa Monica. I got a ride for him in a brand new Chevrolet. This was in 1966, uh, paid him $50. That was his deal money, 50 bucks. And he did not adapt well to the dirt, but he ran the race. And uh, since then I have promoted over 6,000 single day events. But remember, I had 12 racetracks and we can run 10 months a year out here. Plus we ran the Cow Palace, Palace Indoors, the Oakland Coliseum, places like that. So we never shut down, we went all winter. But uh, we actually, the, my predecessors, Bob Barkheimer and Margot Burke, both passed now. 
uh, that pioneered NASCAR in the West between they and myself, same corporation, promoted quite a number more of single day events than anybody in the world ever did. Together, we did somewhere around 12,000 single day races. Wow. Over, well, a period, over a period of 75 years. That's incredible. Uh, Walt, ha having having been a part of that side of things as well uh, with the tracks that uh, Roger not only owned, but also built and uh, and you being a big part of that. Can you imagine promoting that many races? Could you imagine promoting a fraction of that many races and being able to do it? Right. It was it was hard enough just to do the, the handful we did every every single year. You know, we got into the business almost by accident. 1973, Roger and I were, were, were business partners in a Chevrolet dealership here in the Detroit area. And uh, Michigan International Speedway, which had been built in 1968, had gone into bankruptcy. And uh, we were talking one day and he said, you know, I think I'm going to make a bid for that place. Now, we knew nothing at all about the racetrack. <laughs> I mean, zero. And so went to the went to the auction. It was a federal auction and ended up. Uh, I'll tell you the number. We bid two million dollars. For the right to assume the deck. Of the <laughs> And we were the successful bidder. The other bidder was, was Pat Patrick, who uh, some of you know, but uh, and, and, a, and a friend. So we ended up getting that track. I think it was probably in April. Well, there was a NASCAR race scheduled for June. <laughs> Again, we didn't know what we didn't know. So we went out there that first night. I want to tell a little story here. We go out there on, on a Friday and literally Roger and I were selling, selling tickets at the gate selling tickets into the infield, checking campers, trying to make sure that the show goes on. Uh, we were up all night long on that Saturday night before the race, and it was a terrible thunderstorm. We both got soaking wet, had no, had no rain clothes, no nothing. So about four o'clock in the morning, things started to settle down. We went into the infield care center and each slept on a gurney and trying to catch a couple hours sleep before, before the race day. At about 5.15, I remember it vividly, the, the skies had cleared and the doors blew open to the infield care center. And there was this woman's voice and she said, I don't know who the hell you two guys are, but get the hell out of my hospital. And it, it was a woman named Alice Patton, who was the triage nurse in, in Korea, World War II, I'm sorry, World War II, Korea and Vietnam. And she was working for a local hospital. She ran the infield care center. Today, even to this day, the infield care center at MIS is called the Alice Pat Care Center, but the, that's another story. Uh, she threw us out of her infield care center. We went on to do that race. Uh, we then were able to build on, on what happened at Michigan, made it a viable business. And then as time went on, we had the opportunity to get involved in some other tracks, uh, became the promoter of the uh, temporary circuit event in Cleveland. Uh, after, after the city of Cleveland had some issues with the promoter. And it just kind of grew from there. We had brought Nazareth out of bankruptcy. The place had been uh, you know, an empty field for several years. And then we had the chance to uh, do something in California. Uh, there was, a, there was a, an opportunity with the Kaiser company. And uh, of course, our good friend, Les Richter, was really key in helping us learn the racetrack business, learn us, learn, uh, I mean, teaching us how to sell tickets and how to run the track and how to hire people and how to put on a show and how to deal with the sanctity organization, all the things you need to do. And so from that grew this, what eventually became a public company. And I had responsibility for that, for that business for many years and I built California Speedway, invested in Miami Homestead, Rockingham. And then in 1999, we merged the whole thing with International Speedway Corporation, which is good for them and, and really good for us. So my experience while not being quite as, uh, What's the word? I didn't do 6,000 events. But, uh, <laughs> seemed like it sometimes, but uh, not quite like Ken's. But in fact, today, we still talk about racetrack operation. If we're, at, if we're at an event or we see an event on television, we'll talk the following week and talk about how we perceive that show to have been conducted. So, so it continues, but it's in my blood. Yeah, you know, and Ken, um, obviously as prolific as you were, you know, Walt is talking about how with Penske, they started acquiring things and all of that. I know you became the youngest promoter of Sears Point at the age of 29, but 
How does it come to be that pretty much when it comes to the West Coast, and really we'll talk about West of the Mississippi, your name is involved in that in just about every single way. How did, how did you acquire everything you did? Well, when I acquired the company in 1977 that had pioneered NASCAR, uh, they had a lot of racetracks, San Jose, Stockton, uh, all over the West Coast. And I added to it uh, in short time. And so I was involved in modified sprint cars, midget stock cars. Uh, I even promoted an Indianapolis car race once at Sonoma, Sears Point. Uh, the, only, the only event I never promoted in my entire career was a Can-Am. I never, never conducted a Can-Am race. But, and motorcycles were a big part of all this as well. The San Jose Mile in particular. Uh, world of outlaws, but very diversified. Lots of sports car involvement. I sat on the board of directors at NHRA for almost eight years. Uh, I don't even quite know how that happened, but it did, and I did, and so on. Uh, so that's how the diversification took place and occurred. Um, but again, I want to emphasize, I don't want to discourage any young promoters because if you don't have a whole bunch of racetracks, which is a lot of headaches, and you don't have a, a state like California where the weather allows you to go 10 months a year, and we played heavily on the indoor events, you could never achieve those kind of numbers. It would be impossible. At one time, my predecessors had 22 tracks. And they didn't operate as long as I did, but well, I'm still around. You had mentioned earlier, and, and I, I didn't address it, uh, that I'd retired from NASCAR. And that was in 1999. And the day that that occurred, I was sitting with Bill France Jr. in his office. And he didn't ask me, he just said, we're just gonna make a senior exec consultant out of you. And we'll just leave everything the way it is. And, Let's go forward. Well, at the time, I was working on some huge projects, uh, Japan, sponsorship from AT&T, things of that nature. So I, I had built a building in California for NASCAR and Oracle for my tenants. And uh, I just kept going to the office every day and I still get a check every month or week, three weeks, whatever. And, and there was no tax taken out of it. And uh, I didn't carry a business card anymore. Um, I just kept going and I ended up being a consultant for almost to the day, 20 years after I retired from NASCAR. So, and I'm still heavily involved in halls of fame and I'm on the board at Gateway in St. Louis, Worldwide Technology Gateway. And we've got a cup race this year, which we're excited about. And, uh, I'm extremely involved in the West Coast Stock Car Motorsports Hall of Fame. And this book is dedicated to the West Coast Stock Car Motorsports Hall of Fame. Uh, all proceeds from it will go to that organization. Uh, I'm proudly the chairman and CEO of that organization. Uh, we, I'm bragging, but it's a, it's a terrific venue. And in the last five and a, five, four and a half years, we've dedicated in excess of $600,000 to varied charities. And by the end of this year, we'll reach $700,000 in charitable giving. So that's kind of what that's all about. We are the kickoff event for the Sonoma weekend in June uh, on Thursday night. And we'll launch the new $20 million VIP building wraps around turn 11, which is fantastic. So uh, I'm kind of going above and beyond here in detail, but uh, I did want to mention those particular things. Wow. That's fantastic. And by the way, the name of the book, Sea to Shining Sea from the Wild West to Daytona Beach. And uh, really looking forward to, uh, to seeing that, you know, Ken, one of the distinctions that you, and I guess really one other person have uh mike helton is that uh the, the multi-generations of the france family that you had actually worked for well mike and i were talking about that one day and i didn't realize that he'd ever worked for annie b or bill senior which i did and i thought i was the only one left living uh, at a upper management 
position. Uh, and Mike reminded me that he had as well. I, I had forgotten that. But I think Mike and I are the only persons left living that actually worked for every single member of the France family at an upper management level. Uh, if there's anybody, well, no, there, there isn't anybody else. Unfortunately, we, we've lost all of those friends. Les, yeah, that... Les Richter being another one that Walt and Les and I were really close friends. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible distinction. And, and, and Les Richter's names come up a few times and Walt, uh, you and I were even talking last week. I mean, you know, he also seems to be a, a fairly common thread to, um, what a lot of people have done on the West coast in either racing or promoting races and, and all of that. Can you maybe speak to that connection a little bit as well? Well, I really got to know Les uh, when I was back in my American motors days and he was operating Riverside and Someone had told me I was getting ready for my first trip and uh, to the track, and someone said, you really got to meet this guy, Les Richter. Well, I was intimidated by Les. Who wouldn't be? Just, just his physical size, his reputation, both on the football field and his reputation in motorsports. You know, he was the, he was the, and I didn't know Ken at the time, so Les was the West Coast guru. And uh, I'll never forget walking to his office for the first time. I was probably 25 years old. And here's this guy, and I will tell you, he greeted me like he'd known me my whole life. He was a gentle guy, asked me a lot of questions. We talked about it, and that was the beginning of, I say, what became a friendship, because when we bought uh, MIS, Michigan International Speedway, out of bankruptcy, you know, several years later, and I was part of that, Les was really the first guy that Roger Penske called, because Les had been part of the group that helped originally build a racetrack when it was called American Raceways. So, uh, so Les and I worked together on a lot of things, not just at the racetrack. I worked with Les when he was assigned by the France family to go to Washington for a, a year or two in the early 1980s. There was some tax legislation uh, that was being proposed that would do away with the deductibility of sweet expense. And Ken, I don't know if you remember that, but Les got the assignment to go from Riverside to live in Washington with all the politicians. Now that had to be a real penalty. I'm, I'm sorry, Les, but, but he, he handled it very, very well. And they were successful in what they were trying to do, working with other major league sports at the time. So Les, I think people don't give Les the credit. They don't give him credit for his intellect, his business acumen, in addition to what he did as a racetrack operator. And, and, the, and the, like Ken, had the confidence and the respect of the France family. And they relied on him. Bill Sr., Bill Jr. relied on him a great deal. Uh, what they did so as did i so when it came time to build the california speedway we made that decision made the arrangement with, with, with the kaiser company to acquire the land the first guy was les richter and les knew all the people in san bernardino county we need to talk to this commissioner we need to talk to that mayor we need to do this and when we made the announcement i'll never forget les we hadn't even put a shovel in the ground yet brad and les was meeting with all the local civic groups in fontana and Azusa, and all the places nearby, you know, as far as far east as Riverside. I remember he had me come and speak at something called the, the I think it's called the Wednesday Club in, in Riverside. Yeah. I said, I said, Les, what's the Wednesday Club? He said, you'll see when we get there. I said, well, how do they call it? How can they call it Wednesday? He said, because that's the morning we meet. But it was, a, it was a collection of all the influential local business people. So Les had those kinds of contacts. I can't say enough about Les Richter. I know Ken and I still reminisce about some of the times we've had with Les. And that's for another conversation. Someone needs to write a book about him. I need to interject one thing for those that don't know much about Les Richter. He still today is the largest trade all time in the NFL, Los Angeles Rams. He, they traded 11 players for him. He was an All-American at Cal Berkeley. He's in the Football Hall of Fame. And he was just a great big teddy bear. Uh, unless you went against him. And, and that was an education nobody needed to have because he was one tough customer. But a wonderful guy, just a great friend, and we miss him. Yeah. By the way, valedictorian of his class at wow. Cat Berkeley. Yeah. Which means Les was no yeah. dope. Number one in his class at the University of California. Wow. That's that is impressive. About him. Unusual for an athlete. To yeah. He was a smart guy. Very much so. Very smart much so. guy. 
But we learned a lot. We learned a lot. I, I said earlier about the lessons that I know I learned, that Roger learned uh, how to operate how to operate a racetrack. We learned that from Les in our days here at Michigan. We made a lot of mistakes. But to this day, now that we acquired the Indianapolis Motor Speedway here about two and a half years ago, some of the very lessons that we learned and practiced at MIS and at our other tracks, we're applying at Indianapolis to make it more to make it more user friendly, customer friendly, better for the competitors. And it's it's it, and it's you know, here it is 50 years later, where we're doing exactly the same things at Indianapolis. People say, oh gee, this is all new. No, it's the lessons we learned doing it over the years, like like Ken did. You know, I'm glad glad Walt brought that up. I I oftentimes am asked, well, who in your opinion are the greats in motorsports since World War II? And I don't even hesitate. Uh, maybe everybody doesn't agree with me, but certainly Roger Penske is one of my five picks for icons, along with Wally Parks, Anton Holman, and Bill France Sr. and Bill France Jr. Wow. And those are big names in a very diverse form of motorsports. I mean, you talk about, you know, indie car racing to stock car racing to drag racing and all of that. Um, you know, that, that, that's a, a pretty interesting club. Ken, I want to shift gears here a little bit as we talk about the progression of your career, because again, you know, all of the races you promoted, everything that you've done for the West Coast, but you actually worked for Auto Week for a couple of years. And when you and I were talking, that that really stood out as something to me. Um, and, and based on what you said, that actually had a pretty large impact on you and your career. Can you talk yes, about it that? Did. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Auto Week had moved from San Francisco to Lafayette, California, uh, which is 40 minutes away. And Russ Goebel had acquired all of the ownership of Auto Week from his former partner, William Finneyfrock. Um, Russ would have breakfast in the morning, same coffee shop, which was in a shopping center where my office was. And that's how we got to know each other, not in racing. And when the initiative began to build Sears Point, and that all started in 1967, I was invited to come aboard. Uh, for drag racing, Indy cars, and stock cars. And Russ tracked this, and he was very interested, and he had a good business mind. We're still friends today. And uh, so when I went to work at Sears Point after it was completed, uh, almost instantly I knew we, we had financial issues. And we didn't have – well, racing wasn't then what it became. We didn't have television like we do now. Uh, under normal circumstances, we would have probably been okay financially, but we weren't. And so we got closed down and I was out of work. And uh, Russ Goble told me, I'm going to create a position for you at Auto Week. I want you to come to work for me. And I did. And I worked for him almost to the day, two years. Uh, we got a lot done. We covered a lot of miles. I made a lot of very important friendship type contacts all over the nation uh, with corporate people, sanctioning body people, the media, all of that was so important. I didn't realize that at the time, the value of it, but as time went on, I certainly did. Unfortunately, a lot of my friends and buddies and so on are no longer with us. I guess that's what happens when you get old, but um, uh, Walt and I are kind of unique, I think, at our age to still be as active as we are. And I'd like to be around another 10 years. I have no plans to ever retire, but auto week was a big part of my, my early days and, and the contacts and the lessons that I learned there were priceless. You know, you just can't buy that kind of thing. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating how, you know, it's something that by the, uh, you know, entire breadth of your career is a little bit of a departure from most of what you've done, but just how much of an impact uh, that actually had on you. And I, I think a lot of people can relate to, uh, to different things like that. Uh, also, Ken, um, you're related to the Petties in a <laughs> roundabout way. Tell us about that. <laughs> I didn't know if that was going to come up or not. Uh, funny story. In 1970, um, uh, I had, uh, I was still at Sears point 
we were still open. And I went to Daytona for a couple of weeks in February. And it was just pouring down raining one day. And I was in the old STP uh, cement block shed down in the infield because it was dry. And uh, <laughs> Lee Petty was sitting there. And we I had known him from his trips to the West Coast all the way back into the middle 50s, 54, 55. That's when he started coming out here. I was just a kid. But anyway, he was always nice to me. And I always looked up to him. I thought he was a real addition to the sport as, as the whole Petty family. And so anyway, he said, you know, we're related. I said, oh, I don't think so, Mr. Petty. He said, yeah, we are. I said, well, I said, I think I'd know that if, if we were. He said, you had family in Asheville, North Carolina at one time, didn't you? I said, yes, we did. I said, my father's ancestry goes from England to Asheville, North Carolina. And ar around 1799 to 1802. He said, yeah, we're, we're by marriage. We're all watered down, but we're cousins. And I said, well, it makes a great story. I, I got to ask my dad about this. So I did when I got back home. And he said, no, I don't think so. Well, he had a niece in Indianapolis that was doing a family study. And she got back to him in a couple of months. And by marriage, as a matter of fact, I guess we are watered down uh, sixth cousins or whatever, Richard and I have fun with it. You know, I, it's, it's just fun to share the story. I don't know how much authenticity there is to it. I, I'll buy into it, but I don't even know who those people were. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, we can't ruin a good story, so we just need to stick with it. I think that is, uh, that's fantastic. Walt, when you and I were talking last week about Ken, um, one of the things that you mentioned, and we've already talked about uh, Bill France Sr. and Bill France Jr., but really how much they actually relied on Ken and, and how important he was to uh, the company, to the family and everything. Can you speak on that? I, I think that um, the, the answer is yes. Uh, after I got to know Bill, I got to know the France family really after we made the acquisition at, uh, at MIS, but Bill Sr., certainly for sure. And then, and then Bill Jr. Over, over time became great friends. But I do know that, and this is based upon what they told me or what Bill Jr. told me, and what Ken and I have talked about over the years, there was not a decision made as it related to stock car racing in the West without the France family talking to Ken Clatt and having his input. And I've heard some of the great stories, not for this, not for this, uh, this, this presentation, not because they're not worth telling, we just probably don't have the time. But I've heard, I've heard them, and uh, there's no question about that. He's the man, he being Ken, is the one who really had his hand on the pulse. He was, he was running the business, he was there, he lived it, he knew the people. He knew who would say yes, who would say no. And before the fans finally did anything, uh, Ken was really the guy that they relied on. No question about it. You know, Ken, it's interesting. Here we are sitting talking on Zoom and all the technologies that we have here in 2022. And obviously, um, you know, as your career is going and your relationship with the France family and, and promoting all of the racetracks, you didn't have the same conveniences like we have here today. Uh, yet you all remain close. I mean, even to the point of spending Thanksgivings together. Yes, we, we did. Uh, we would go to the Richter's Mountain House, Lake Arrowhead, California, uh, Bill and Betty Jane France my deceased wife, uh, Jackie and Marilyn and Les Richter. And even Brian joined, Brian France joined us one Thanksgiving. And it was kind of like a family getaway thing. Uh, the guys would go down to the Hilton Hotel and have a couple of cold beers and come back and we'd have a big turkey dinner and build, we take turns putting wood in the fireplace. And then in later years, uh, business related, we would stay at the France home. Uh, and we had, I think, all together about five Thanksgivings uh, in Daytona with Bill and Betty Jane. But the wives played a big role in this. My deceased wife and Betty Jane France were closest friends and uh, had been for many, many years. From the day they met, they clicked. And so, yeah, a lot of wonderful memories. And 
I, I laugh about it. We were presenting Tommy Kendall, uh, in, bringing him into the West Coast Stock Car Motorsports Hall of Fame, I guess it was a year ago. And he referred to Richter, Bill France Jr., myself and John Cooper as uh, Bill Jr.'s Daytona Beach Blue Blazer Mafia. Now, I don't know where it, Tommy ever came up with that, but, but he liked to say that. He had, you know, way back when he was real young and I first knew him, we, anyway, he, st he still it's, says by that. Way, it's true, it's true. <laughs> Well, I, <laughs> wait, the mafia part or, or the story about Tommy yeah. Kendall? Oh, probably. <laughs> no, we, we weren't in the mafia. Uh, I never met Meyer Lansky or like Lucky Luciano. But um, anyway, fun times, great memories. You know, you know, Brad, we're talking about all these wonderful people who influenced Ken's life and my life, certainly. But one of the things about the book, and I've got it right here, by the way. This is, these are the drafts that I was getting. These are the I get one of these chapters a, a week. Wow. Through it, what really what really struck me more than anything else about the book were the people that, that Ken writes about. These characters. I mean, it's it's almost like Damon Runyon esque, if you know what I mean. These are people who probably were, were, were created by some script writer or some author, no, no, they're flesh and blood. And the things that they did, both as racers and business people and members of Ken's family, but that probably struck me more than anything else. Again, as a, as a racer myself uh, and, and being in the sport, I think I understood a little bit, a little bit better about their, their psyches. But trying to dissect them as individuals, I think Ken does really a good job getting into that as well. That's, to me, that's the most striking thing about the, about the book. Yeah, you know, Go ahead, Ken. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I'll be 83 in a couple of weeks. And I, again, I have no plans to ever leave the sport. Uh, and it's about the people. It's about the Walt Zarnickys and the Roger Penskys and the Steve Phelps and the Doug Bowles. And today, uh, I feel an obligation that if I can contribute, then that's what I need to be doing, even if it's a very small contribution from time to time and i love it I, i'm just i love the sport you know, go ahead walt i was just going to say it can struck me in reading the book and some of the characters some of the racers i heard a term 50 55 years ago someone referred to a person i won't mention his name i don't know if he's still alive or not as the original bucks down racer i don't know if you ever heard that expression the original bucks down racer there are a lot of bucks down racers in this book and how they make do and how they scrap together to do what they do to, to build cars, run the cars, run the racetracks. It's, 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 it's a true great American story. It, it, for sure. And, and I mean, just thinking of the evolution of racing as well and, uh, and Ken and, and Walt, everything that you have seen and even from the racetrack promoter side of things, you know, where we are today, especially when we look at all of the big events and, and quite honestly, it doesn't matter which form of motorsport you're in. Uh, every single one of them has these big major events, but, you know, going from promoting weekly racetracks and different things like that. I can remember the first few races that I promoted in the early two thousands were with the world of outlaws at, at Texas Motor Speedway's dirt track. And back then it was like, Hey, do you have a TV deal? This is going to help. And that's going to help, you know, long before that, it was about putting out flyers and getting the word around town and like you know to your point hey if we can get this one well-known racer to our event then it's going to draw even more people to their event you know ken and walt for both of you maybe if you can talk about the evolution of promoting races and how it was back then and sort of how it grew and where we where we are now you know brad well, one story one story comes to mind very very quickly another <clears throat> we, we have an affiliation with the wood brothers as you know in the nascar series and so I've gotten to know the Wood Brothers and the family over the years and think the world of them. But I'll never forget, oh, several years ago, maybe 20 years ago, uh, I was at a race and uh, Glenn Wood was there. And Eddie and Lynn and uh, uh, Leonard were also part of it. And Glenn looked at me and he said, you know, he said, I always remember you from those days at MIS. He said, you were the money guy. You gave us the going home money. Well, that's what you had to do to help get the names to promote the event. We had to pay the Wood Brothers 
$500 to come to Michigan, give them enough money to get there and get back. Because at that time, they didn't run a full schedule. They ran 15, 16 races a year. Those are the things that, that I learned. And again, that story came to mind right away. I was actually talking to Eddie Wood at, at, at a track recently. We were, we were talking that, they're telling that story about we, those guys needed the money to be able to come, but we needed them to sell our tickets too. We needed David Pearson to run at Michigan. So Ken, I'll defer to you. Well, first race we ever did, we were uh, stapling up posters on telephone poles, going into businesses, asking if we could put posters, big, nice, attractive posters in their windows. Uh, we didn't buy TV. Radio, we would go to the stations with a driver and they would do interviews. Uh, newspaper advertising was very important where today, unfortunately, it's all different. It's changed. Uh, we ran a tight budget and it was not easy to pay the bills. I mean, I, I had some success early on and then in November of 1966, in one day, I lost $10,000. And I didn't have $10,000, um, even though I'd come from the uh, competition side of the sport. Some of the guys were mad. They were angry. I remember so clearly Jack McCoy, who was a top, top notch West Coast guy for many years, uh, stood up and said, well, wait a minute, guys, it's Ken. He's going to pay us. He, did, he only had 800 people here today. And, and I did, it took me two weeks, but I got everybody paid. And, but that earns you some recognition from a trust standpoint. Uh, and I'm, early on, the most important thing to me, in addition to promoting a race properly, was pay your bills. Win, lose, or draw, be sure you've got the money to pay your bills. Walt referred to what I call deal money. Uh, I remember a Oh gosh, this was a long, this was like 1969. I was in Les Richter's office after the Riverside 500 in January of that year. And he, here came the guys from North Carolina, South Carolina, wherever. And Les had a whole pile of hundred dollar bills. And that's exactly what happened. He was handing out money for the guys to get back to the East Coast again. Not uncommon. John Cooper one time told me about Richard Childress and Chocolate Myers uh, leaving Riverside with a, an old Chevrolet truck and one car on the back. Richard drove it and they stopped at Indy and asked John Cooper, who was at that time the president of Indianapolis Motor Speedway, if they could sleep under a tree that night. And he, hell no, he said, let's go get a good meal in the restaurant. And he put him in a hotel room and they got showers and that's what we were all about. We helped each other. We, we might, I don't want to get into uh, brawls and all that, but that did a little bit of that went on, but, but you might be eating with that same guy three hours later. It's like a big family. Yeah, it is a big family. And you know, the fascinating thing, and I really do look forward to reading the book again, it's called see the shining sea from the wild west to Daytona beach. But when it comes to promoting races and, and, and Ken and Walter, I mean, it comes through with both of you, a lot of racetrack promoters might focus on the back gate, the competition side or the front gate, the fan side or something like that. But when you really cover everything and uh, with everything that you did, Ken, obviously making sure you take care of when I call them the customers, the ones that are racing, the ones that are actually coming in and buying the hot dogs and enjoying that to Walt, even more recently with Indianapolis motor speedway, you know, the stories of, you know, you and Roger, and everyone literally walking the entirety of the grounds and so many improvements that are made that might not necessarily be tangibly noticeable on the outset, but you walk away going, wow, the place is just so much nicer. These are things that everybody sees. And those are things that really make great racetrack promoters. And the reason why we're still able to do this here today, because the foundations that were laid uh, by you, Ken, and, and obviously Walt, everything that you've done in your career with all the people you've done it with. Thank, thank you very you. much. The real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Francis, Judy? What, what a great session. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it so much. Really, it's terrific. And uh, I don't know, Francis, I could sit here for a couple more hours and listen to 
both Ken and Walt and their stories. And I'm definitely going to pick up a few of your books, Ken. So I'm going to keep my eye on that. You want one more story? Of sure. course. One more story. Judy, seeing yeah. Judy sit there makes me think of it. In 1969, we did an all funny car, big drag race at Sears Point. And it, it, it was quite an event. Well, Linda Vaughn was hired to come and, and do what she did, Miss Hearst Golden Shifter. She came into my office on Friday morning. I never, oh, I think I had talked to her a time or two, but I didn't know her. And I, out of the blue, I said, what are you doing for dinner tonight? I was divorced at the time. What are you doing for dinner tonight? She says, I have no plans. I said, would you like to go to San Francisco and have a couple of cocktails and a nice dinner? She, I'd love to. So we go to what was one of the very finest restaurants in San Francisco at that time, uh, the La Trois. And we were sitting there kind of getting to know each other. Uh, wasn't a romance or anything like that. Just, well, we're still close friends today. But anyway, sitting across in the restaurant was a fellow that I'd gone to high school with, played ball with him and so on. He was, he was good. I wasn't, but uh, we were friends and he was sitting there with his wife having dinner and he acknowledged, I hadn't seen him in a long time. So anyway, after they finished dinner, they came to the table and we shook hands and exchanged hugs, and I introduced them to Linda and so on. A few months later, we had a class reunion, and his name was John Cadwell, and John was one of the master ceremonies, and he's, he was talking about successes of some of the classmates and uh, where they'd gone in life and this and that. He said, I kept the best for last. You all remember Ken Clapp sneaking down on the football field with a race car and getting caught and all that back in the day and always going away to races. And we didn't understand any of that, but he's living his dream and he got to do what he wanted to do. None of that's important. What is important is he's dating Dolly Parton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> End of the story. That's it. <laughs> I've heard that best. story from you, Ken. That's <laughs> very true. So, well, thank you for joining us. I hope to see Welcome. you next month, Indy 500. Can't wait. Thank you. Me neither. Thank you. And Ken, yeah. I'll see you at the June 9th the West Coast Stock Car Motorsports Hall of Fame. Thank you. And thank you for having us on. And I'll see you at Indianapolis in May also. Yeah. Good. Before, before June 9th. Thank you, Brad. Thank you very Thanks, much. Brad. Thank you. This is wonderful. Registering on EPAR Trade is easy. Fill out your name, email, phone number, and create a secure password. Next, select your business type. Choose supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose racing business if you're looking to find new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional racing team. Begin typing your company name. We most likely already have your company in our database, which you can select from the drop-down. Then, enter your job title. Choose claim company if you'll be editing your company profile. Other members of your company can choose join company if they'd like to use ePartrade as well. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. You'll need to confirm your email once it goes through. To keep our platform industry only, you'll be approved shortly after. If we require additional proof of business, we'll reach out. Welcome to ePartrade.